our third speaker of the session. Uh, we go to US, to the Yale University with Nicolas Monjardino Koch, uh, working in their Brick Labs, who is going to, to present a talk titled Combining Fossils and Phylogenomics to Understand the Origin of Sun Dollars. So, uh, Nicolas. Hello. Hello, Nicolas. How, how are you? Fine, thank you. Okay, so should I start? Uh, are you sharing the screen? I am now. Can you see it? Wait a bit. We can see you, but we cannot see your screen. Okay. Um, let me. We can see your picture. Okay, now it says that you are sharing your screen. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay, awesome. So, um, thank you all for being here. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Um, thanks to Rosa and Jesus for inviting me and for setting this up, which has been amazing. Um, and we've heard throughout this symposium amazing examples of how uh, the phylogenomic revolution has um, drastically modified every single aspect of phylogenomic, of phylogenetic research, of, of functional genomics. But today, instead, I'm going to focus on the type of questions that phylogenomics cannot answer, at least not uh, by itself. Um, and that's, that type of questions broadly lies within the realm of macroevolution. Uh, and the problem here is that the vast majority of species, more than 99.9% .9 of species that ever existed are now extinct. And so incorporating this extinct diversity uh, is, is, is obviously crucial to understanding evolutionary processes. We're trying to infer patterns and processes that happened a very, very long time ago. But we're doing this if we rely only on genomic data. We, we're doing this only sampling extant diversity, which is a very small fraction of the entire evolutionary history of the clade and a very non-random fraction. And so it's obvious that we're gonna, we're gonna uh, find numerous statistical issues by trying to do this. And it's been shown through simulations that incorporating fossil record uh, into, for example, the inference of modes of macroevolution. So for example, whether uh, continuous traits such as uh, body, body size, for example, follow Brownian motion patterns or actually evolve under some kind of trend towards higher or lower values. This type of modes of macroevolution cannot be uh, statistically teased apart in uh, phylogenies that are ultrametric, that include only extant taxa. There's also a huge uh, uh, body of research showing how the fossil record strongly modifies our understanding of diversification dynamics, um, how it strongly impacts ancestral state reconstructions and ultimately modifies uh, our understanding of morphology, ecology, and biogeography, all of which to some extent depend on algorithms of ancestral state reconstruction. And so it's, it's evident that exploring this type of questions requires that we integrate phylogenomics with the fossil record. And to do so, uh, I work mainly with sea urchins. Uh, the reason why I chose this group is because I think sea urchins provide uh, numerous, uh, have numerous qualities that make an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary clade to which to with which to tackle these type of questions. So not only they have a good extant diversity and we can constrain the relationships of the extant lineages based on phylogenomic data, but we can also, they also have a high fossilization potential. So there's a wealth of stratigraphic information that can tell us the time of origin of morphology, the time of extinction of clades. And they furthermore have a very complex morphology so that we can actually combine molecular stratigraphic and morphological data all together and, and build a phylogenetic phylogenetic framework that encompasses all of the diversification history of the clade, not just the extant lineages, but also the extinct ones. And for a long time, uh, this sort of uh, avenue of research was halted by the fact that morphology and mole early molecular studies, including mostly single genes, uh, ribosomal, mitochondrial loci, uh, systematically disagreed with respect to the position of a few clades. Um, and a few years ago, uh, we published the first phylogenomic analysis of sea urchins. And we were able to find uh, extremely strong phylogenetic signal against traditionally uh, accepted morphological hypotheses. So 
we are very confident on this tree. We 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 uh, looked at it from many different angles, and and we always obtain the same topology with very strong signal. No 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 evidence that any of this was due to any systematic biases. And so this is great because we've finally been able to, to reduce a lot the topological uncertainty. We know now where many of the most difficult to place lineages within the urchin tree uh, actually fall. But on the other hand, I would like to argue that this has probably opened up more questions than it has answered. And to explain better why I think this is so, I'm going to zoom in into this clade over here. Uh, and this clade is the one that contains, for example, the sand dollars. So I hope you're all familiar with the sand dollars. Uh, it's an extremely derived clade, both morphologically and ecologically. They don't look like sea, sea urchins. They don't do things like any other sea urchin lineage. And for the past probably 200 years or so, uh, sand dollars have always been assumed to be the sister group to a rather similar clade, the sea biscuits that you have here on the left. And you can see uh, the extreme similarity of some forms of sea biscuits and sand dollars. This node uniting the two has absolute support from morphological phylogenies. And this clade that unites the sand dollars and the sea, sea biscuits was always thought to be subtended by a paraphyletic assemblage known as the Cassiduloids. So the Cassiduloids uh, were never thought to be a monophyletic group, but rather some sort of um, a paraphyletic assemblage leading up to the origin of the last common ancestor of sea biscuits and sand dollars. Um, our phylogenomic results instead have corroborated the fact that at least some extant Cassiduloids are closely related to sand dollars to the, exclusions of, the exclusion of the sea biscuits. And you can easily see how this uh, topology is, is rather problematic. And it leaves, leaves a number of unresolved questions. So first of all, how do we reconcile this tree with morphological evidence? So uh, like I told you, the sea biscuits and the sandars, the, the clay that unites the, the two of them is supported by a wealth of, of morphological synapomorphies, uh, including extreme test flattening, uh, the presence of internal test reinforcements, which are found in no other clade of sea urchins. The fact that they both have uh, teeth, so the star-like structures in the center of the test are the Aristotle's lantern, the tooth apparatus, which is absent in the adults of all other irregular lineages, which is a broader clade that they, both of these belong to. So all of this, um, all of these traits and many more uh, must have evolved either convergently or have been acquired once and then reversed, but there, there, there has to be some, some degree of homoplasy here, but we can't really tell which one, whether it's a pattern of convergence, a pattern of reversals, because both of these are equally likely if we just sample the extent uh, diversity. The other question that's unresolved is, uh, where do we classify all other Cassiduloids? So just to show you, this is a, on the right, this is a morphological tree. What I'm, what I'm highlighting here in yellow are the sand dollars. Uh, that red clay there are the sea biscuits. And what we've shown with phylogenomic data is, uh, first of all, the sand dollars and the sea biscuits are monophyletic in this clay because in this topology because this is a morphological tree. But we have shown is that this lineage, lineage specifically over here, the lamp urchins, is the sister group to the sand dollars. And uh, it's not evident what happens to the rest of the casiduloids. Everything else that's not here shown in colors is a casiduloid. It's not evident what, evident what happens to them once we move the lamp urchins from that position and into the clade uh, contain, uh, that contains the sand dollars and the sea biscuits. Since this is not a monophyletic lineage, it's not clear what happens when you move one. Do they all move with it? And are they all part of the clade of the sand dollars and the sea biscuits? Do some move in and are some are others left behind? We really don't know where to classify any of these other lineages, most of which are extinct. Um, and the other question that's unresolved is how long ago did the last common ancestor of sand dollars and sea biscuits live? So as you can see, neither one of these two clays has any fossil record that's older than the Eocene. The inclusion of the lamp perchance within this, this clay already pushes their origin by at least 25 million years. So there's a fossil gap with no record of their, of their origin, although they must already be uh, alive, uh, at least by the late Cretaceous. But if in fact all of the Cassiduloids are part of this clade, then you can see that this would push back the origin of the sand dollars and the sea biscuits way back in time, uh, generating some sort of ghost, ghost ranges um, that are impossible.
but we can't really get at this question with traditional node dating approaches because we don't know which fossils to use to calibrate this node in the first place. And so uh, what we, we decided to do instead is combine morphological, stratigraphic, and genomic data in a total evidence dating framework. Um, and the problem that we face here is that um, this type of, type of tip dated uh, phylogenetic inference typically uses somewhere between five and 25 loci. And by this time, we already had about two and a half thousand loci. So the problem here is that we need to find a way to meaningful, meaningfully subsample the molecular data set to roughly 1% of its site. It's find, find the 1% of the best genes, which is clearly quite difficult to do. Um, and if we look at what people have done in the past, uh, people approach different approaches that people have used to low size subsampling. Most people uh, have used have done this based on a single property. So some people would have said what you need to do is try to minimize systematic biases. And so here on the top, there's a distribution of one proxy for systematic bias. This is the empirical data for the, the echinoid phylogenomic matrix. And so this approach would say, for example, um, let's subsample by retaining the 20% of loci that are least affected by biases. Other people will say, no, let's maximize phylogenetic signal. And so here on the bottom is a proxy for phylogenetic signal, the average bootstrap support of the gene tree. And this approach would entail retaining 20% of the loci with the highest uh, phylogenetic signal. And the problem is that we don't really know whether or not these two approaches are different or are sort of targeting the same number of genes, the same, uh, the same genes. Uh, maybe a, a priori, we can think that throwing out the bad genes or keeping the good ones would sort of narrow into the same set of good, reliable genes. But no one has ever actually looked at this. And if they're in fact different, then which one of the two is preferable? Which one is actually giving us access to the good genes? And so to look at this uh, in a different perspective, here are the, two, the same two variables. Each dot here uh, is a gene, and we have on the y-axis signal. On the x-axis, we have bias. And what we're doing to this distribution when we're applying these thresholds to subsample uh, is, is, is doing something like this. So we're keeping the ones that are colored, uh, either high signal or low bias. And as you can see, um, both of these approaches are actually entirely different. So they're only selecting 4% of genes in common. So they're extremely different approaches to low size subsampling. They're targeting completely different genes and likely using one or the other one is going to have dramatic consequences downstream. But which one of the two is preferable? And so if we look at the centroids of the dis dis distributions here in gray, you have the centroid of the entire distribution in red, the one that you obtained after selecting genes with low uh, evidence of bias. Uh, when you do this type of subsampling, not only you're decreasing bias, which is the main objective, but you're also decreasing signal. And conversely, when you try to increase signal, you're also increasing biases. And this emerges from the fact that these two properties are positively correlated. So there's no way in which we can subsample from this distribution in a univariate way and not either increase both or decrease both. So they're not, it's, there's a constraint that doesn't allow us to optimize both dimensions simultaneously because ideally we would like to increase support while at the same time decreasing uh, uh, increase signal while at the same time decreasing error. And so I would say that neither one of these is actually preferable. Neither one is giving us the, the, the small set of really good reliable genes. And so to do this, uh, it's evident that we need to simultaneously account for multiple gene properties. So we devised a way of doing this. We measure seven different uh, gene properties, uh, four proxies for bias, three proxies for signal, and we use principal components analysis to rotate this data set and use the correlation structure between these seven variables to give us new access with which we can possibly uh, subsample uh, genes and obtain a good set of, of, of loci. And so we were quite excited when we found out that the first PC axis of this data set, which explains about 50% of variability, is uh, literally the rate of evolution of the genes. So here is the, the scores of each gene along PC1. Here's the rate of evolution that we inferred. And they're, all, they're almost, uh, they're, they're ordering loci in almost, almost the exact, exact same way. So here on the right, you have the loadings of each one of the proxies for bias and proxies for signal to, on, on PC1. 
And as you can see, what what this what subsampling based on PC1 is doing to the data set is getting giving us high evolving genes that are have a lot of phylogenetics uh, information, but have a lot of biases as well. PC2, on the other hand, um, is almost uncorrelated with uh, rate of evolution. If anything, it's targeting sort of intermediately evolving genes. And you can see here on the right, the loadings of the different variables. And PC2, what's doing is it's giving us access to these uh, genes that are um, have a, a lot of phylogenetic signal, but it's simultaneously targeting genes that have low systematic biases across all of these proxies. And so we truly believe that PC2 is some sort of axis of phylogenetic usefulness. And we went on to test this using numerous statistical methods, and we can show that subsampling genes along PC2, of this data set at least, uh, gives us access to genes that have increased phylogenetic signal, but minimize all sources of biases simultaneously, but also reduces the hetero heterogeneity of the data set, which is uh, also a, a problem of many phylogenomic data sets. And so once we did this, we decided to combine morphology stratigraphy with the 50 top scoring loci along PC2. And we obtained tree for all sea urchins. And I'm not going to walk through it, but I'm just going to zoom in to this region of the tree. This is the region that includes the sand dollars, the sea biscuits, a different clade of, of excellent echinoids that is not, not important today. And everything else that I'm showing you here is like a sigiloid. So as you can see, we took what was so, supposed to be a paraphyletic assemblage and we split it into three highly supported monophyletic clades. Um, Two of these clades are actually members of the clay that includes the sand dollars and the sea biscuits, uh, including all the extant forms. A third clade is entirely unrelated to any of these lineages uh, and includes all of the uh, old uh, Mesozoic forms, Cretaceous and Jurassic, all the lineages that, if included within this clay, would have pushed the origin of the last common ancestor of sand dollars and sea biscuits way back in time. So that doesn't happen. Uh, specifically because this clade is actually not, not related with the other legacies. So with this approach, we've been able not only to, to resolve the relationship of all these lineages, shed new light on uh, their uh, time of origin, but also um, we've been able to shed new light also on their morphological evolution. So here are some of the characters traditionally used to, to, to uh, support a monophyletic group of sand dollars and sea biscuits. And we've been able to show that while well, some of these actually arose independently within the two lineages, others did actually arise in the common ancestor of the two clades and were subsequently reversed in, in some of the members. And we can only tease apart these two patterns and shed light on the, on the unique evolutionary, morphological evolutionary history that led to the origin of, of this entirely morphologically weird clade of sand dollars uh, because we have a topology that includes living and extinct members because this, this two patterns are only distinguishable uh, due to the fact that some unique attributes of sand dollars and sea biscuits are shared with extinct casiduloids and some are not shared with extinct casiduloids. And so for the conclusions, I, I'd like to argue that phylogenomics needs the fossil record and the fossil record needs phylogenomics. Um, while genomic data improves topological accuracy and provides with, give, gives us access to really robust topologies for the extant uh, clades, paleontological data improves macroevolutionary accuracy. And we, we, if we want to uh, resolve questions of morphological evolution that happened really long time ago, of modes of macroevolution, of continuous traits, or, or, species, or rates of species diversification, we would like to actually simultaneously reduce uncertainty both uh, topologically and from a macroevolutionary perspective. And that's where genomic and paleontological data actually uh, reinforce each other. But we also need to better understand the consequences of subsampling loci from phylogenomic data sets, because many, many times when we're applying this sort of filters to phylogenomic data sets and reducing their size, we think we're doing something to the data set. Uh, if we take this, if we actually measure multiple properties of the genes, uh, it's not clear what subsampling based on one dimension is actually doing uh, on the other dimensions of this problem. And, and that's all I have to say today. That's, uh, that QR code leads you to the preprint where all of this is uh, presented. And I would like to uh, acknowledge the contribution of Jeff Thompson, my, my collaborator at uh, University College London. And that's it. Thank you all.
Thank you, Nico, for your very nice talk. Um, we have a first question by Russell uh, Garwood. Uh, yeah. He's uh, asking, how much missing morphological data is there in your fossil taxa? Are there synapomorphies supporting your fossil clade? Um, hello. Um, uh, yes, there's 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 about uh, twenty. There's about a thirty-two percent missing data in fossil lineages, a twenty-five percent missing data on extant taxa. So the difference in, in in missing data in the morphological data set is not dramatic between fossils and and uh, extant taxa, and that's something that uh, it's pretty unique to sea urchins. And there was another question. Uh, the second question was: Are there synapomorphies supporting your fossil clade? Uh, yes, yes, there are synapomorphies supporting many of these fossil lineages. Uh, uh, like I said, some of those uh, are actually reversals or convergences, so they're they're not uh, uniquely and unreversed, but they they are providing support for that. Uh, the the if if you analyze the morphological data set by itself. Uh, many of these clades are not monophyletic, so a lot of the signals that's also contributing to their, uh, their monophyly comes from their, their time of, of existence, from the, from the tip dates. Great, Nicolas. Uh, I, ha I have a quick question if uh, no one is asking. Go for it. Uh, thank you very much. So, hey, Nico, I would like to know, uh, hey. we, ha we have heard a lot of talks about the, 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 the ways of identifying uh, bona fide orthologs. Uh, in, in the molecular realm. When you are talking about morphology, what do you believe more in the orthology statement of morphology? It's easier to identify a real ortholog, let's say homolog uh, character in as a morphological or in a molecular data set? <laughs> um, I guess uh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I've never thought of it in that, in that way. Uh, I guess both of them have, have unique issues. Um, um, I think I think probably what we consider to be uh, homologous traits in morphology, uh, many of them probably arose more than once. Um, and 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 as you can see from my phylogeny, a lot of those traits that we thought were uh, had a single origin have have a much com much more complex history. Um, still, though, uh, there's they have two or three steps. Uh, parsimony steps in a tree. Uh, they're not. They're not. So we, they're not. They're not unique. They not arise. One, they not arose once. But uh, they're not also very far from that truth either. Um, and I don't know. It's, there's 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 a lot of uncertainty as well in the in the in the inference of orthologous loci for molecular uh, from molecular data sets. And I think maybe at least I'm not sure which one is which one we can trust more. I think maybe it's a lot more difficult to diagnose each of some pathology in molecular data sets than it is in morphological ones. Thank you. Thank you, Nico. Uh, there are more questions in, in Slack. Please uh, feel free to, to yes. have a look at your dedicated channel. And I think we should move on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you very much. So.